our last video, we analyzed one of the worst folds in the history of mankind, and some in the peanut gallery questioned why we were even mentioning game theory in a hand where people were cold calling 10 big blind raises with total gutter trash. If none of the players even knows what a solver is, isn't trying to apply GTO to assess their play utterly useless? Well, the notion that game theory can't or shouldn't be applied in certain scenarios is a common misconception, which we will attempt to disabuse in this video. Since game theory optimal is not a technical term of art, much of the disagreement in regards to the whole exploitative versus GTO debate is simply definitional, where people end up just talking past each other. You see, broadly speaking, there are two primary schools of thought when it comes to GTO. Probably the most common way people think of and refer to GTO is that it is whatever the solver says it is. In other words, the GTO strategy for a particular scenario is the Nash equilibrium output calculated by the solver using the parameters of that scenario as the input. We will refer to this as strict GTO. Those that subscribe to this school of thought tend to learn GTO mainly through memorization. They look up or drill specific scenarios and then mimic the solver's outputs when they encounter the same or similar situations. The other school of thought, which we will refer to as conceptual GTO, doesn't rely as much on precise memorization, but rather focuses on utilizing principles from game theory as guideposts to help reason their way through strategic decisions. This latter approach is the one that we take on this channel, but this is not to say that it is superior to strict GTO. Each has its place. Strict GTO is most effective at high stakes online, where a greater percentage of the player pool studies using solvers. Against an opponent that is playing a GTO-based style, the strategy that will maximize EV will also be based on the Nash Equilibrium, and it's often the player that does more detailed solver work that will have the advantage. However, against an opponent that is imbalanced, a strategy based on a solver output will not be profit maximizing and sometimes may not even make sense. But one can still employ game theory principles against an imbalanced opponent to maximize his EV. To explain further, we're going to review another hand from Hustler Casino Live where most people have less balance than Sean Deeb's diet. And this particular game involves a lineup with even a lower level of competence than the gaggle of degenerates from the last video, social media influencers. Specifically, this hand is between chess master Alexandra Botez and Bryce Hall, who I had never heard of before, but apparently he makes dance videos on an application called TikTok. Aura, yeah. By the way, I engage. We, that. we did. This is Shadow. You can follow her at LoveSky777 on Twitter and Instagram. You raise. Matthew Harrington in the chat says running it twice shouldn't even be allowed. Well, it's all about the players. If the players want to do it, it's about them, you know? But if you hate running it twice, check out Max Payne Mondays each and every Monday at 5 p.m. Again with the clips? No running it twice, needling, Not slow again, rolls, you guys want encouraged. Swimming? Top two for Alex. All right. I'll check. Check. Or you have to so Bryce opens under the gun and Alexandra Cole calls in the cutoff. The flop is ace-king-4 and Bryce checks, Alexandra bets small and Bryce calls. Bryce's check with the underpair seems perfectly fine, but what about Alexandra's small bet? Can we analyze this from a conceptual GTO perspective? Well, although there are many different principles that impact an EV maximizing strategy, perhaps the two most important ones that should be considered in almost all scenarios are balance and probabilities. Let's talk about the latter first. Since in poker our opponent's cards are hidden, in order to craft a rational strategy, we can't just assume that our opponent has one specific hand. Instead, we need to consider a probability distribution of hands that our opponent is likely to have based on prior actions, which always starts preflop. In this case, Bryce opened an early position with a gigantic raise, 20x the big blind. Now I didn't watch this whole stream because I want to retain my brain cells, so I'm not sure what the customary opening size is in this game. But generally, the larger you raise, the stronger your range needs to be. 
Perhaps Bryce uses some super sophisticated split sizing technique where he raises larger with strong but vulnerable hands like pocket eights, and then he uses smaller sizings with nutted hands like pocket aces, but for purposes of our analysis, we're going to utilize this 200 big blind 9 max range as a rough starting point. Now, as mentioned, theoretically, the opening range for a 20x raise should be much tighter than the opening range for a 3x raise, but these guys are also playing very loose, so perhaps these variables offset each other. Additionally, since we're analyzing this hand from a conceptual GTO standpoint and not a strict one, having very precise ranges isn't overly critical. We'll be using these solutions primarily as a visual cue of the types of combos that the players might be holding, and this seems somewhat reasonable. So the next question is, how did Bryce's flop check impact his preflop range? Well, intuitively, you would expect Bryce to continue betting with many of his strongest hands that want to start growing the pot, given that the players are relatively deep. And since, as we mentioned, his range should be relatively strong and interact well with this board, it would also be safe to assume that if you were holding something relatively weak, like Queen Jack or Queen 10 suited, he would try to leverage his strong range on this Ace King board to bluff. This means that when Bryce decided to check instead of bet, the probability of him holding something very strong or something very weak should decrease, which by process of elimination means that the probability of him holding something middling should increase. In the universe of conceptual GTO, we call this a mid-heavy range, and generally speaking, the predominant bet size you'll want to use against a mid-heavy range is on the larger side. A larger sizing gets more value for your strongest hands and applies the most fold equity for your weakest hands. Note, however, that when you use a large sizing, it will usually mean that you must play in a more polarized fashion, meaning you should generally only be betting with your strongest and weakest hands, but in this case, top two is certainly going to be strong enough to allocate to the big bet bucket. And against the small bet that Alexandra actually used, we see that Bryce's decision could go either way, as a call or fold. But if Alexandra had used the larger sizing, this would have been just a fold, which as we'll see, ends up being consequential. You gotta be kidding me, what a turn yeah. card. What a turn card, oh. Well, look at twice. Oh. Once. You sure? Yeah. What do you okay. have? What do you have? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> are you kidding me? What do you have? Jesus you Christ. Oh my God. Twelve thousand dollar pot. Bryce one card away from doubling up. <laughs> and in the mask. Okay. Should've, 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 there's nothing I can do. I'm not gonna fold no, Ace King. Not, yeah, you can't, especially when you flop two like a pair. Oh, she did. Yeah. Botez looking for an Ace or a King. I am alive. What does she need? Ace or King. Wouldn't that put me in? A it hurts. A I'm boat? gonna lose to someone. Yeah, That's yeah, what I need here. Yeah. Nice job. job. Two How clips. How much did he have? How much are you? So since Bryce ended up with all the chips, this jam must have been the correct move, right? Well, not exactly. This is what we refer to as results-oriented thinking, which is tempting to do in poker, especially when you are raking in or losing a massive pot, but this can lead to ingraining very bad habits. Just because you bet your paycheck on lucky number seven in roulette and win, it doesn't mean that this is a winning strategy over time. In poker, Individual results are essentially meaningless in the context of a lifetime of playing the game, so it's critical to develop a solid foundational strategy that gives you the best chance to win over time, and that is something conceptual GTO can help provide. So in this case, not surprisingly from a strict GTO standpoint, betting here, let alone shoving, is even less rational than a tweet by Prahlad Friedman. But why is this the case? Well, this is where the other fundamental principle of conceptual GTO comes into play, balance. Recall what we said Bryce's checking range was mostly comprised of on the flop. Middle strength hands like perhaps weaker ace x, king x, and under pairs. And even if Bryce was savvy enough to slow play some nutted hands to protect his checking range like the solver, many of those hands would have had an incentive to check raise Alexandra's small bet to jumpstart growing the pot with the goal of getting stacks in by the river. This means that his likely range on the turn is even more mid-heavy than it was after his flop check. And so the next logical question is, what does this eight of spades change? 
Essentially, this turn has no interaction with any part of Bryce's range except perhaps pocket eights and ace eight. And given the sizing, over 3x the pot, including ace eight is a bit of a stretch, especially if you think Alexandra regularly cold calls ace king preflop. And on the bluff side, this 8 doesn't bring in any new straight or flush draws. Although, as mentioned, Bryce could have raised preflop with something like queen jack or queen 10 suited. If he decided not to bluff those hands on the flop, donk jamming them on this turn doesn't really make any sense. So basically, what Bryce is saying here is I have exactly pocket 8s. It's really the only logical hand that can make this play. Now, of course, imputing logic to this sort of riffraff is dubious, but when you're playing against an unknown villain, you kind of have to assume some rationality to devise counter strategies against, or else you're just clicking buttons. So as a general matter, in Bryce's shoes, we want to avoid taking actions that only a very small number of hands in our range have an incentive to take, because narrowing your range dramatically simply makes you easier to play against. In this case, although this bet ultimately worked out for Bryce because Alexandra happened to have top two, if she just had a pair, which was much more likely, folding would have been relatively easy and Bryce would have lost out on many chips. So how do you avoid playing face up like this? Through balance. But when we say balance, we don't mean perfect balance in accordance with a solver, where we are mixing combos at the exact right frequencies using a randomizer, as is the case with strict GTO. We simply mean playing hands of different strength in similar ways, just enough so as to disguise our strategies. Recall how we said that since villain's cards are hidden, we need to consider a probability distribution of hands that they could have. Well, villain doesn't know our cards either, so we want to take advantage of this fact by keeping as much of our range intact as possible through balance. And the level of balance a person needs to effectively disguise his strategies will depend on the context. In most live environments, the level of balance you need when betting basically amounts to just sometimes showing up with value and sometimes showing up with bluffs. That will usually be enough to keep opponents honest and on their toes. However, if you're playing high stakes online against regs who have HUDs that allow them to analyze your tendencies in all spots, then the level of balance you will need will be much higher. So as a practical matter, how might one incorporate balance in this type of setting? Well, one simple way to do it is by using range morphologies, which we alluded to earlier. As mentioned, given Bryce's check call on the flop, his range was likely mid-heavy, and mid-heavy ranges tend to play passively because most of the range consists of mediocre hands that don't want to play a huge pot and would prefer just getting the showdown. And since the 8 of spades on the turn doesn't really change anything, Bryce's range should still be mid-heavy. So in this scenario, simply following the primary incentive of this morphology and checking all hands would be a very easy way to maintain some semblance of balance, which ultimately disguises your strategy. In contrast, when you take a line that significantly deviates from your range's morphology, a huge chunk of hands are stripped away, providing less cover for your actual cards. Additionally, although it's conceivable that Bryce could have had some strong hands here, such as slow played aces or kings, since this 8 doesn't significantly improve Bryce's range, there's a good possibility that if Alexandra had something strong enough to bet on the flop, it is still strong enough to bet on the turn, which would give Bryce the opportunity to check raise. The same is also true of Alexandra's bluffs. Now let's talk about Alexandra's call. What does strict GTO say about this spot? Absolutely nothing, because Bryce's donk shove is simply not a thing. There's no coherent Nash equilibrium response to a play that is utterly incoherent. But conceptual GTO can still be applied as follows. At the baseline, when facing any bet, game theory suggests that you should call with any hand that you think beats villain's weakest value hand, and then you should also call some hands that are slightly below this threshold, called bluff catchers, and then you fold the rest. In this case, if you thought Bryce could be doing this with a slow played ace king, or perhaps something like ace eight, then this would be a pure call. But if you think he's only doing this with a set, then ace king, despite being extremely strong, is merely a bluff catcher, which potentially could go either way. And the amount of bluff catchers you need to call with will be heavily dictated by the size of the bet, which in this case is huge. So as a practical matter, from a conceptual GTO standpoint, 
Alex only needs to call a small fraction of the time, and Ace King is perhaps her best bluff catcher. It beats all bluffs, it blocks aces and kings, and even against Bryce's eights, it potentially can draw ahead to a better full house. Now, Some of you may be thinking to yourself, didn't we just say that Bryce's bet doesn't really make sense as a bluff? Well, yes we did, but for anyone that has played live before, you know that sometimes people just lose their minds and do random nonsense, which playing with just a modicum of balance will protect you against. Even if you aren't perfectly balanced, taking a stand at least once in a while with a bluff catcher will let people know that you simply cannot be run over. That all being said, this particular situation is so unique with a massive donk overbet that only makes sense with one specific combo, that dramatically overfolding here probably isn't a bad idea. Although as we mentioned in the last video, you generally want a strategic framework that causes you to call with some bluff catchers to avoid overfolding in the aggregate, this situation is a bit of a one of one scenario that is very different from the hand we reviewed last time. In that hand, Nick was facing a check raise with the nut straight and a redraw to the absolute nuts that would have beat 100% of Villain's value. Also, it was plausible to think of plenty more bluffs that Villain potentially could have had there, such as a flush draw or perhaps a pair plus a straight draw. And on top of all that, Villain was someone who called himself Dark Knight and was dressed like an 80s rapper. So although from a conceptual GTO standpoint, whenever you face a bet, you generally want to bluff catch some of the time, there are exceptions to every rule and I think it would be reasonable to significantly overfold in this specific spot due to its absolute absurdity, while at the same time ensuring that you are bluff catching in more common scenarios over the long run to avoid being run over. So that is the video for today. Thanks for watching and until next time, stay balanced.